Here's the, here's the thoughts, uh, my thoughts or general thoughts behind the Cartesian equation of line in Rn. So when you start with the parametric equation of line, something like this, if you want to convert this into the Cartesian equation, first you need to have components of your vectors. So you have to have a component here. You have to have a component here. Yeah. So I will do it. It's the first time. It's the first time, actually. I, I think so. Well, it's the first time in this course, for sure. And it's very likely it's the first time in your mathematical experience. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you like a sort of a general argument in the, con in the context of the general Rn space, general n-dimensional space. The argument itself is simple, but it's the first time we do this kind of thing, so you should be excited. My vectors in Rn, each of them I I'm going to write in a component form. So I'm going to give each of them a component, I mean like a coordinates, and I'm going to do it in a very efficient way. Remember this way we wrote the elements of n-dimensional or n-tuples. Here's my n-tuple. It was my, if you remember, that was a nice, good, efficient abbreviation for n-tuple writing. Here's another n-tuple for the vector b, and I'm going to give another n-tuple for the vector x. You look at this symbol, you look at this symbol, but you picturing the column of height n with the components filled in. And the same, the same you do when you look at this symbol, the same you do when you look at this symbol. Now, look what I'm going to do. I'm going to sub in my n tuples in this equation, and this time I'll do it in the expanded version when I write the n tuples in the full length of it. Here we go. Here's the left-hand side. Here's a substitution for n tuple on the left-hand side. Look at this. First line, second line. Well, because we have so many of them, we will just hide the rest of them under dots. And normally, it's a good practice when you indicate the last one, where you stop. Here. Here's my left-hand side. Oops. Here's my left-hand side of this vector equation where I substituted the n tuple for the x vector. Now, if I sub in my n tuple for the right hand side, I will do it in two. I mean, like I will combine two steps now. Of course, there will be a big column in this position. There will be a big column in this position. But when I start doing the algebraic manipulations with those n tuples, we know how we do that. When we scale my n tuple with the coefficient lambda, we have to scale each component by that coefficient. When we add two n tuples together, we have to add two n tuples in a pro-component way. So if I just do these steps in one go, that's what I will have. I will have a big n tuple where the first component will be like this. A1 for the first component in this n tuple, B1 for the first component in this n tuple, and lambda goes for this coefficient. Second component will be like so. Normally, when you write, uh, when you finish writing two components, you more or less understand what sort of like a uh, rule which explains what what's the rest of the n tuples should look like. That's why you can can hide the rest of them with the dots. And normally, it's a good practice when you write the last one as well to indicate where you stop in your writing of components of n tuple. And that's how my equation will look if I sub in my n tuples. Now we have another thing when we discuss with the n-tuples, how we identify n-tuples. When we identify them, we identify them in a per-component way. So we can identify x1 with this, x2 with this, xn with this. If I do that, uh, I'll probably do it in a streamlined ver version. So what I'm going to do when I say streamline, I'll take like a middle line in here some line which is hidden by these dots and I write how it, how it will look for this middle line. Normally people just choose an index name like k different from this and write this in terms of this index a, sorry. And they write this in terms of this index k. So what I'm going to write is this, look at this. If I take the some kth component on the left hand side it will be x sub k. It will be equal. If I take the corresponding kth component on the right hand side it will be something like a k plus lambda b k. And that's true for every component, right? So my k here, it's sort of like a uh, generalization for 
for values either 1, 2, many others, and the last one is n. That's a nice way to write things when you want to make them compressed, when you make them efficient. So I wrote only one line, but adding this piece, I mean all of them. Now, the reason I wrote this, because actually I want to solve this. I want to solve this for lambda. Let me just move this down a little bit. I want to solve this for lambda. If I solve this for lambda, actually I want to test my software, if you if can solve for lambda. No, maybe it can, let's just see. Oh, it says it can. Let's just see what it will give me. Oh, beauty. If I solve this for lambda, it's a little bit awkward the way it wrote it, because probably it will be more like a conventional to put xk first and negative ak second, but I hope you can make this adjustment when you look at this expression. Uh, if I solve this for lambda, I draw your attention to the fact that lambda here is independent of the index k, isn't it? That's the reason actually I solved it for lambda, because everything on the right-hand side here is depending on k, but nothing on the left-hand side depends on k, which means my left-hand side is identical across all of these k's. So in fact, what I can do now, I can equate all of the right-hand sides together for different k's. And that's the equation. Each of these fractions individually, each of these fractions individually, simply lambda. Because of this. But together, together, it's something which is called Cartesian equation of the line. And that's the purpose of this demonstration. It's a, it shows you the connection between the Cartesian equation and the parametric equation, or sometimes parametric equation is also called vector equation of, line, of the line. Uh, you don't have to repeat these steps every time you have to convert from one to the other. The connection is very clear after we establish that. All we have to do, we have to take the components of A vector, and we have to subtract them here in the enumerators. And all we have to do, we have to take the components of B, and we have to plug them in at the bottom here. So every time in the question you convert from one to another, it's a very easy conversion. You don't have to follow these steps all the time. We did it once, we can now enjoy it. We just take the numbers and just toss them around and put them in the right places. Here's the example. Yeah, here's the example. This example we did just, just now with you on the previous slide when we found, when we found the vector equation for the line. Page 18, example number one. Now, having this in mind, I can convert this to the Cartesian form straight away. All I have to do, I have to take this A vector and I have to put it in here. And I have to take the coefficient next to the lambda, 1, 6, and negative 4, and I have to put them at the bottom. Here it is. This is a double identity, which effectively the Cartesian equation of my line in three-dimensional space. With the minor alterations, normally when you look at the three-dimensional space, when you look in the three-dimensional space, we still follow this historical convention that the components of my x vector, components of my x vector on the left-hand side, they denote it by x, y, z, rather than x1, x2, and x3. It's just a pure tribute to the history and the pure tribute to the way it was done in three dimensions. When you go higher, we go x1, x2, x3, x4. But in three dimensions, we often replace the indexed elements here with the conventional x, y, z. And that's the answer to the question. Good. If you do similar trick for, well, that's another example we just did with you, we, the vector equation for the line, vector equation for the line on page 18. Second example, again, conversion to, conversion to, Cartesian equation is simply just moving the numbers around. All I have to do, I have to put the A components here. And all I have to do, I have to put the B components, 5, negative 4, negative 3, in the denominator positions. Here's the result of that conversion. It's not much thinking involved here after we've done all of the preparation here in the general context. There's not much thinking, it's just like a moving the numbers around. 
but you still have to be able to do that I mean to see this step I mean yeah. uh, well the opposite process most of the time it's again the same straightforward process as before here's the example in two dimensions conversion of the conversion of the Cartesian equation, the line given in Cartesian form into the vector form, and this time you see the line given in the in the like a classical school form, a classical school Cartesian form, y equal k x plus b. All we have to do, we have to take this and we have to convert this into the Cartesian or universal Cartesian form. Look, look, look what I'm going to do. I'm going to write like this. I'm going to separate the variables y on one side, x on the other side. And now I'm going to write it like this. I'm going to write it like this. You see, I just replaced the left-hand side with the fraction with the 1 in the denominator, some trivial change. And here, I just introduce 0 here, and the denominator, my, my denominator is 1 half. If I do these conversions to my classical-looking, school-looking Cartesian equation of the two-dimensional line, this two identities become looking like this. And so now the next step from the Cartesian form to the vector form, again, it's very clear, right? Here's my components for the A vector, 1 and 0. It's the components for the A vector. And here's the components for the B vector, 1 and 1 half here for this B vector. So the vector equation for this same line is my A, is my B, 